Good morning, and welcome back to Global Neurosciences Institute Grand Rounds. Um, and now, with a great pleasure, I'm introducing today's speaker, Dr. Karen Greenberg. Dr. Greenberg is board certified in both emergency med medicine and neurocritical care, and is specialized in the treatment of neurologic emergencies. She's a director of the Neurologic Emergency Services at Crozier Chester Medical Center. Dr. Greenberg's work was critical to the establishment of the nation's first dedicated neurologic emergency department. The American College of Osteopathic uh, Emergency Physicians recognized her innovations to speed critical treatment to patients experiencing acute ischemic stroke and awarded her its inaugural practice innovation award. In 2021, she received the Will, uh, Willoughby Award that honors a top female leader in emergency medicine. She has advanced the state of neurologic emergency treatment and has published research in neurosurgery, the American Journal of uh, Emergency Medicine, Emergency Medicine Clinics of North America, and many other journals. She graduated from the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey School of Osteopathic Medicine. She was chief intern and intern of the year and completed her emergency medicine residency program there, serving there as chief resident. Dr. Greenberg is an assistant professor of neurosurgery and emergency medicine at Drexel University College of Medicine. Dr. Greenberg will be speaking today about acute stroke care. Dr. Greenberg. Hi, good morning, Peter. Thank you so much for that introduction. I am very excited to be here with all of you guys virtually this morning. Uh, thanks for everybody turning in, tuning in. Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Way to start it off. Um, there we go. Okay, great. Um, really, truly, you know, thanks to everybody for being here this morning. I think that talking about neurologic emergencies and stroke updates is always a, a really great topic. I say that in emergency medicine, there's not a lot of new things that we're doing. The treatment for sepsis has really been the same for many years. You give your 30 cc per kilo bolus, you give antibiotics, you find the source of infection and you admit. Uh, even things like post cardiac arrest with targeted temperature management, you know, in 2023, we're not even really sure that that benefits patients anymore. We're still doing it, but it's really stroke that things are constantly evolving and changing. So again, give yourselves credit for being here this morning and thanks for coming along with the ride. Uh, I don't have any financials disclosures. We will talk about a couple things that are off label, but will hopefully become more mainstream. And the objectives are pretty straightforward today. We're gonna talk about current studies and challenges in acute ischemic stroke and different controversies. I am going to be focusing on acute ischemic stroke. I was going to do one of my topics on hemorrhagic stroke, but I think that Dr. Pandey from Michigan six weeks ago did a really thorough, excellent job on that. I'm happy in the Q&A and chat at the end. If there are specific questions about hemorrhagic stroke, I'm definitely happy to talk about that as well. But for the next 45 minutes to an hour, we're really going to focus on acute ischemic stroke. And I think that that's important because those are the patients that we can benefit and get better at. We're going to talk about four different hot topics in stroke over the next hour. Hot topic number one. This is from the 2019 American Heart Association guidelines for acute ischemic stroke. And what it's saying is that IV alteplase administered greater than four and a half hours can be beneficial for a subset of patients. And this is really altering in stroke care. We have been hung up on a time window of four and a half hours for 30 plus years. And because we're restricted to that four and a half hour time window, we're really missing the opportunity to treat a lot of patients. And if we could get rid of that time window and move more to a tissue window, and I'm gonna talk about that coming up, could we treat more patients? Why is that needed? 
So we're going to have uh, Ursula for all of you Disney fans out there. And if you're excited about the live action movie, she's going to help us here. Basically, here in the United States, we do not do a good job of treating acute stroke patients with IV fibrinolytics. In fact, the numbers are pretty poor. Poor unfortunate souls in pain, in need. The poor unfortunate soul, it's sad, but true. This poor unfortunate soul. Yeah, thank you, Ursula. In the United States, we only treat about three and a half to four and a half percent of patients with IV fibrinolytics. Now, this percentage is low because this includes all patients in the United States that have a discharge diagnosis of stroke. Most patients who get to us have an exclusion criteria right away that they can't be treated with IV lytics because they're outside of that four and a half hour window. Other patients have exclusions because they're taking Coumadin or they're taking DOAX. Uh, maybe they've had a recent stroke in the past three months. Maybe they've had a recent hemorrhage in the past couple months, or maybe they've had a major surgery. But the biggest exclusion criteria is that time window. There have been several trials now trying to see that if you have an unknown time of onset of your stroke, could you benefit with fibrinolytics and specifically these trials that I'm going to talk about all look at IV Alteplase. There's the wake up trial and there's the Mr. Witness trial. Wake up trial happened in 2018. It happened overseas in Europe. Usually all of these trials happen overseas first because their research protocols are much more lax than here in the United States. And basically the wake up trial, you had an unknown time of onset of your stroke and you came to the emergency department and we put you in the MRI machine using DWI and flare to determine if your stroke was more acute rather than out rather than completed infarct. OK, so if you are positive on DWI, negative on flare, that meant that your stroke was more acute. Whereas if you were positive on DWI, but also positive on flare, your stroke was now completed and you would not be a good candidate to get IV lytics. The primary outcome was a modified ranking score of zero to one. And if you were able to be treated with IV alteplase, 53% of patients achieve that modified ranking score of zero to one compared to only 41% of placebo patients. And their rate of intracranial hemorrhage was 2%. If you were treated, 0.4% if you were not. The Mr. Witness trial uh, happened here in the United States at Mass General. There you had to be discovered within four and a half hours. Okay, so let's say you were last known normal at midnight. Somebody finds you at 8 a.m. So you're last known well eight hours ago, but they brought you to the emergency department at 9 a.m. They found you at 8 a.m. They got you to the emergency department within four and a half hours of being discovered. OK, again, using MRI in this study, DWI and flare, could we treat you with IV lytics? This study used primary outcomes of intracranial hemorrhage rates. They only had one intracranial hemorrhage out of their 80 patients. And so one out of 80 was 1%. And then they were also looking at symptomatic edema. They had three patients out of 80 for about 3.8%. So what we're talking about here is patient A, you can see that they're positive on their DWI, but they're negative on their flare. So this is a patient who could receive alteplase, even though they're greater than four and a half hours from last known well. Whereas patient B on the bottom, they're bright on DWI, but they're also bright on flare. So this would be a patient with a completed infarct. We would do more harm than good. So therefore, they're not a candidate to IV alteplase. But Dr. Greenberg, it's really hard for me to put my stroke patients in an MRI machine. Maybe I only have one MRI machine. Maybe it's only available from 10 in the morning until 2 p.m. That's really common for our community hospitals across the country. So then you have the EXTEND trial that happened in Australia and New Zealand. And here they're looking at now CT perfusion. 
and they're doubling the time window from four and a half hours to nine hours. Okay. So yes, there's still a timeline on this, but we're at least doubling the time window to try to see if we can get more patients treated. This trial uh, had a primary outcome uh, also of a modified ranking score of zero to one. If you could be treated with IV all to place, 35% of patients were able to achieve that good outcome compared to only 29% of patients who were unable to be treated. The symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage rate in this trial was 6% compared to only 1% with placebo. But 6% is the rate that we quote all patients going all the way back to 1995 in the NINJ trial. Okay, so the risk was basically the same, but we're extending the time window. And what you're looking for here is again, patient A, you can see they've got increased time to peak on the left side of the screen there. Here, your blood flow is decreased, but the blood volume looks normal. So this is a patient in that four and a half to nine hour window that could get alteplase. Whereas patient B on the bottom, you've got your increased time to peak, you've got your decreased blood flow, but you also have decreased blood volume. This is a patient now with a completed infarct, and you're probably gonna do more harm than good if you treat with IV alteplase. So yes to patient A, no to patient B. I do think that hospitals across the country have more access to CT perfusion, and this is probably going to be more reasonable. This is the protocol that we're using at Crozier. We are treating patients past the four and a half hour window. But again, it's a challenge for community hospitals to have access to MRI or CT perfusion. Here is the first case that we did at Crozier, treating a patient past four and a half hours. All of these cases will always be our real cases. 71-year-old male, last known well at 630. He was found by neighbors in the laundry room with confusion, unsteady gait, and slurred speech. He got to the ED at 1056. Even with our crazy fast door to needle times, we still can't get a patient treated within four minutes, right? So he's exactly <laughs> up against that four and a half time window. But because of our protocol, we're able to put him in our extended trial or treatment. He's got risk factors. He's got hypertension, high cholesterol, known stenosis of left M1, maybe a history of seizure. We look at his vital signs, his blood pressure looks good, right? We need the blood pressure still to be less than 185 over 110 to treat these patients. And we need a blood glucose. His exam, he's confused. He's got a mild facial droop on the right. He's drifting on the right. He's got some slurred speech with an expressive aphasia and some ataxia. His stroke score is an eight. We go to CAT scan, we don't see any hemorrhage. On his CT perfusion, increased time to peak, decreased blood flow, but normal blood volume. This is exactly what we're looking for, that he has all penumbra at this point, really hardly any completed infarct, and that he'll be a good candidate to still get treatment with IV alteplase, despite being outside of that four and a half hour time window. We're looking now at tissue window. And sure enough, on his CTA, the right MCA goes all the way out, and there's a cutoff here of his left MCA. The inclusion criteria here are pretty much the same for the four and a half hour window. The uh, exception here would be that you do need to have an NIH stroke score of at least four to be included in the extended time window. And the exclusion criteria are pretty much all of the same. His brother shows up, we do get written consent in this extended window, okay? I do not get written consent to treat patients in zero to four and a half hour window. But with these extended window, we are getting written consent as a caveat. The patient himself, he has an expressive aphasia, but he is able to understand us and nod and at least give verbal consent. So the Alta place was given at 11.43 a.m., which is five hours and 13 minutes from last known well, and he gets admitted to the neuro ICU. Why does he get admitted to the neuro ICU and not go to intervention? 
because he rapidly improved with IV alteplase therapy, and it actually aborted the need for intervention. His NIH stroke score came all the way down to a two, and it was really just for a mild facial droop. He was actually discharged to home with PT, OT, and speech. And this is really exciting. Hopefully my excitement comes across for you guys, because in the past, this is a patient who would not be able to be treated. Not only was he able to be treated, but it aborted the need for something even more invasive like an intervention. And I think that's important because a lot of emergency physicians, and we'll talk about this more with topic number three, they're still hesitant to want to give IV lytics to patients. They think that the trials, that the data is not really there. They think that we're doing more harm than good. And if you can have a thrombectomy, let's do that. Well, the neurosurgeons themselves will tell you that what they do to patients is not completely benign either. In fact, they're going to quote you higher rates of intracranial hemorrhage than 6% because they're going into small arteries in your brain and manipulating them. They'll quote you maybe a 10 to 15% chance risk of bleeding with what they're going to do. So this was a very exciting case. It was our first one, uh, obviously, with a good outcome. You're looking at his MRI here with just small hits on DWI of what his residual deficits were compared to the CT perfusion that I'm reminding you of at the bottom where that whole hemisphere was really infarcted. Pushing the envelope even further, we were at International Stroke Conference last year in New Orleans in 2022. We were invited to have a moderated poster. And some of the things that they were talking about there was the Chablis trial, which is actually looking at treating patients up to 24 hours from last known well and looking at tenecteplase instead of alteplase. This trial was done in China. Their primary outcome was looking at good reperfusion rates. That meant that if you were an intervention candidate, you achieved a Tiki 2B or greater. If you were not an intervention candidate, did you improve on your perfusion study by decreasing the area of penumbra by 50%? Secondary outcomes were modified ranking score of 0 to 1, modified ranking score of 0 to 2, or did you improve on your NIH stroke scale by 8 points within 24 to 48 hours? Or did you go to an NIH stroke score of 0 to 1 within 24 to 48 hours? They tried to present this as positive early findings. I'm a little suspect here because if you look, part one here is looking at different doses of TNK. They achieved their primary outcome 32% of the time with the lower dose at 0.25. But their symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage rates were 11.6 and 9.3, but any intracerebral hemorrhage was close to 50%. And that's a pretty high percentage <laughs> to be saying that this is a positive uh, initial data. And then when they looked at TNK only versus TNK with intervention, this is really interesting because the patients did worse with intervention probably because they weren't selecting the correct candidates. But again, intracerebral hemorrhage rates, symptomatic was 6% versus 17%, but any intracerebral hemorrhage was 26% with TNK only. And tenecteplase plus intervention, there any intracerebral hemorrhage was up to 60%. We'll watch this trial to see what the rest of their data shows. I just want you guys to see what's out there and how we're continuing to push the envelope. For hot topic number two, we are now going to do a deeper dive into tenecteplase. If you've noticed, I've been saying alteplase instead of TPA, and I've been saying tenecteplase for the most part instead of TNK. TPA and TNK sound very similar. We want to try to say alteplase and tenecteplase so we don't get them confused. Basically, there is another lytic on the block, which is tenecteplase. And again, this is from the 2019 American Heart American Stroke Guidelines, that it may be reasonable to choose tenecteplase over IV alteplase in patients without contraindications to IV fibrinolysis. We are also doing this at Crozier. Okay, we have switched our lytic to tenecteplase 
uh, let's see, oh, it's almost exactly a year ago. We switched in February and we did our first case in March, okay? For those of you who are already using Tenecta Place, what's gonna be really neat about me discussing this is I'm going to give you our real-time data that we've been doing at Crozier. So maybe you've read the papers, maybe you're using it, maybe you're using it yourself, but I'm actually gonna give you our experience over the past year with Tenecta Place and where our numbers are at. I'm not gonna really talk about this slide. What I want you to realize about this slide is that Tenecta Place has been around since at least 2010 for stroke, but it really just caught a lot of traction within the past couple years. And of course, Tenecta Place has been around for the treatment of myocardial infarction for many years. I don't really want to date myself too much, but my experience with Tenecta Place was giving it for myocardial infarction in the emergency department. So the way that it went with STEMI was we would just give lytics. Then we would give lytics plus intervention. And now pretty much in 2023, all patients just go straight to intervention. And we'll talk more about that. Basically on this slide, what we're trying to show you here, Tenecta Place has been around since at least 2010. People are looking at different doses. They're looking at head-to-head -head comparison with Alta Place and Tenecta Place. We've pretty much found that the sweet spot of dosing is 0.25 mg per kg. 0.1 is a little bit too low. 0.4 gives you an increased rate of symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage. There are a lot of pending trials out there. Some of them are still looking at dosaging. Still, some of them are still looking head-to-head, -head, Alta Place versus Tenecta Place. But other trials are seeing if we can use Tenecta Place in the extended window. The big trials, again, it gets a little confusing that a lot of these trials are called extend trials. <laughs> Extend IA Tenecta Place Part 1 was a head-to-head -head comparison of Tenecta Place versus Alta Place. Basically, more patients achieved a modified ranking score of 0 to 3 in the Tenecta Place group versus the Alta Place group. And then Tenecta Place Part 2, Extend IA, now we're looking at comparison of the dosing. Should we use 0. 0.4 versus 0. 0.25? And again, with the 0.4 dosing, you were just seeing more rates of symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage. So the 0 0.5, 0 0.25 mg per kg group was doing just as well with less complication rates. When you talk about the clotting cascade and how clotting works, so tissue plasminogen activator activates plasmin that then breaks down fibrin into its degradation products. What I want you to pay attention to on this slide is there's something called plasminogen activator inhibitor. So in our bodies, we have plasminogen activator inhibitor that basically makes alteplase less effective. Why is that important? If you do a head-to-head -head comparison of alteplase and tenecteplase, both of them have direct activity against the plasminogen activation, but the, the plasminogen activation inhibition is low for alteplase, meaning it doesn't work as well, but it's 80-fold higher with tenecteplase. Tenecteplase also has greater fibrin specificity. It has a longer half-life. It's a one-time dose. There's no messy calculation like alteplase we're going to give you 0.9 mg per kg for a max of 100 kilos. We're going to take 10% of that and bolus it, and then we're going to drip the rest in over an hour. With Tenecta Place, it's the 0.25 mg per kg, again, based off of a max weight of 100 kilograms, and it's a one-time dose and you're done. So looking at the comparison there, there's definitely some advantages uh, for Tenecta Place. What are some other advantages? It has better fibrin specificity. For our spoke hospitals, this has the potential to really be a game changer. Because it's a one-time bolus, there's no infusion going. And that's really important for patients who need transport. All of a sudden, you don't need a critical care nurse to go with your patient from the spoke to the hub because there's no infusion going. You've given the drug, it's on board, let's drip and ship and let's do it quickly and faster. 
We're achieving faster door to needle times because it's a single bolus. It's a simpler cal calculation. Again, there's no infusion and it is less it is uh, less expensive than all to place. It's about $6,000 compared to $8,000. What are some disadvantages? You do still need to stock two lytics in your emergency department for different conditions. For example, all to place is only is the only recognized drug for pulmonary embolism still. You are still going to need to have both drugs around and you're going to need to be careful about saying what you need all to place versus tenecta place. There might be some dosing errors during the conversion period. We've been so used to giving 0.9 mg per kg for so many years and now you're changing it to 0.25 mg per kg. Tenecta place uh, is not reimbursed if it's wasted. And that's because it's not FDA approved for the use of stroke. Right? The reason why uh, all the place is reimbursed if you mix it and don't use it is because it is FDA approved for the treatment of stroke and Genentech will reimburse you. For Tenecta place, we're not there yet. By the way, Gen Genentech does make Tenecta place as well. So there's really no discrepancy there either. Again, uh, GNI, Team GNI, we were at International Stroke Conference last year in New Orleans. One other thing that was presented about Tenecta Place, this was the certain collaboration. And what they were looking at was rates of symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage. For all to place, the rate was 3.6%. And for Tenecta Place, it was only 1.8%. So not only are there many advantages to giving Tenecta place, it looks like there's potential for it to also have less risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. So Dr. Greenberg, everything that you're telling me sounds too good to be true. If Tenecta place is really that much better, why isn't my hospital using it yet? Why haven't we been using it all along? And the simple answer is that it's not FDA approved for the treatment of acute ischemic stroke. Let's think about that for a second. Guess what? Neither is Alta Place in the three to four and a half hour window. Alta Place is only FDA approved for the treatment of stroke in zero to three hours. It's American Heart and American Stroke that approves it in three to four and a half hours. Okay? So that really shouldn't be a problem to stop your institution from doing this. In fact, American Heart and American Stroke, they actually recognize that patients who receive IV Tenecta Place if you arrive by two and get treated by three hours, that's the STK4 measure that primary stroke centers and comprehensive stroke centers track. And these patients are now included in that get with the guidelines data. So again, American Heart, American Stroke does recognize Tenecta Place as an IV lytic. I would say that probably one of the best things is that if you have switched or if you're thinking about it, it was one of the easiest protocols to change because literally the only thing that changed in our protocols was the drug. It's the same post IV thrombolysis order set. It's the same protocol. It's the same monitoring. It's the same care. It's the same indications, the same contraindications. We literally are just swapping out the drug. Really important here. The dose is 0.25 mg per kg based off of a max weight of 100 kilos. Your max dose is 25 milligrams or 5 mLs. This is important. Tenecta place comes as 50 milligrams and 10 milliliters because that is the max dose if you're going to give it for a myocardial infarction. Okay. This isn't different than Alta place for stroke. Alta place comes in a hundred milligram vial, but the max dose is 90. So you're always going to waste something with Alta place. You're at least going to waste 10 mLs. Okay. Same thing with Tenecta place. When you mix it, you're always going to waste and then use your dose. One of the tricks is it comes with a 10 milliliter syringe in the packaging. You can try to have five ml syringes just next to the box to remind you that you're only going to give five milliliters, especially when you're making the change, okay? With that max dose being 25 milligrams, there have been errors with that. 
what's our real time data at Crozier? We went live with this 13 months ago, but we didn't give our first case for a month. It's weird how stroke comes and go <laughs> comes and goes with IV lytic candidates. So we went live with it, but we didn't actually have a candidate for a month. From March to March, March 2022 to March 2023, we've done 38 cases and we've only had one hemorrhage for 2.63%. Pretty great. Okay. Looking at our data for all to place the year before, if we do March 2021 to March 2022, we had a couple of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhages back to back. We had four hemorrhages out of 42 cases in the year prior to making this change, which was an intracerebral hemorrhage rate of 9%. That's high. 9% with all to place the year before. 2.63% currently with tenecteplase. Really key here, we did have one dosing error. Shortly after making the change, we had one of our emergency physicians give the max dose of 50 milligrams. If you look at the packaging on tenecteplase, the dosing is for myocardial infarction because that's what's FDA approved. It will say if you're a certain weight, your max dose is 50 milligrams, okay? Our patient was having a real stroke. They got double the dose, but they did not have any bad outcome, luckily. I'll tell you that I just spoke at uh, Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, their annual emergency conference just last month. And somebody in the audience, it was somebody from Einstein, they had the same mistake. They gave the MI dosing and their patient actually did have an intracerebral hemorrhage from that error, okay? So if that's two of us in a, in a room that have had the same dosing error, this is really important to pay attention to. And something really cool, somebody who was in the audience, uh, he and I went to residency together. Again, not going to tell you how many years ago. He works at Atlanticare. After coming and listening to my talk last month, he needed to give tenecteplase to a stroke patient and his EMR flagged him that he was giving too small of a dose because their EMR also has the FDA approved dosing for MI. He reached out to me. He said the computer wanted me to give more. I had just come to your lecture. I knew that was incorrect. He emailed his director of the emergency department. He took it to their pharmacy P&T committee and sure enough, they've made that correction now. So pretty cool. The other thing that happened to us is it's very, very innate for emergency medicine physicians to say, give TPA, okay? Because both drugs are in the Pyxis, right? Because you still need alteplase for pulmonary embolism or cardiac arrest. That alteplase is there, okay? So be really careful with your stroke patients that you're going to give tenecteplase when you make the change and not alteplase. This is what the packaging looks like if you're going to give it for MI, okay? So here, if your weight is greater than 90, it says that you're going to give a dose of 50. Don't do that, okay? This is the packaging for MI. The dose for stroke is 0.25 mg per kg, max dose of 100. This is our very first connected place case at Crozier. It's super straightforward, but I just wanted to show you how easy it was to make the change. 64-year-old female, she woke up normal and walked to the bathroom. Her family heard a thud. She's found on the floor, unable to move her right side. She screams stroke. She's gazing to the left. Her whole right side is out. She's getting some words out, but it's pretty incomprehensible. She's had a history of a stroke four years ago, no residual deficits. Her blood pressure looks good. It's less than 185 over 110. Her blood sugar's normal. Her NIA stroke score is 20. That is a very big stroke score for a patient. This is the only time that you can see blood on a CAT scan and still treat with IV lytics. This is the hyperdense MCA sign in her left MCA. You're actually seeing the blood clot in her vessel. She got to us at 801. She was treated with tenecteplase by 823, 22 minute door to needle time. And as expected, when you look at her perfusion study, increased mean transit time and time to peak here on the bottom. She has decreased blood flow, and she actually has this, 
a good amount of decreased blood volume. So she definitely already has some core infarcts, but she definitely has a lot of salvageable penumbra as well. And on the CTA, as expected, we don't even see that left MCA vessel. She goes to thrombectomy with Dr. Liebman. This case obviously was early in the morning. We give the TNK, call to Dr. Liebman, heads up. Uh, I suspect that I'm going to have a large vessel occlusion here. Pre-intervention picture, you see that there's no blood flow to the brain. And post-procedure, magic perfusion. Thank you, Dr. Liebman. Thank you, Tenecteplase. And again, nothing fancy here. It's a straightforward stroke case, just showing you that the lytic changed. Bonus, all of the nurses love it. We have not heard one negative comment about making this switch to tenecteplase. At the ease of administration and the ease of transport, it's really gone well for us. Let's move on to hot topic number three, and this is a big one. Among patients with acute ischemic stroke with an LVO and eligible for thrombolysis, should we skip the thrombolysis and go directly for mechanical thrombectomy? I already mentioned how myocardial infarction goes. When I was a resident, we gave lytics. Then we did combined treatment of lytics and intervention. And pretty much now in 2023, every patient just goes for intervention. Emergency physicians are especially excited about this because remember I mentioned there's a good percentage of emergency physicians out there that still don't buy into giving lytics. And they're really excited that maybe we don't have to give lytics and stroke patients can just go to intervention. Stroke will never be like heart attack. When I'm working in the emergency department and somebody hands me an EKG with tombstones on it and ST elevations, pretty much 100% of those patients go to the cath lab. There's only five, six, seven vessels in the heart that need intervention. With stroke, only about 15 to 20% of stroke patients actually have a large vessel inclusion that you can fix. The internal carotid artery, the middle cerebral artery out to the branches of M1 or M2, maybe the basilar artery as well, okay? That means that 80% of your stroke patients are not a candidate for what the interventionalists do. Sure, if you're a candidate for it, your outcomes can be great, but the majority of stroke patients are small vessel strokes. If you're going to say that I'm going to hang my hat that this patient has a large vessel occlusion and hope that they go to intervention, you're going to be making a grave mistake and mistreating the majority of stroke patients. Okay. This topic is also for my colleagues out there who are at comprehensive stroke centers or thrombectomy capable centers. If you're at an acute stroke ready hospital or a primary stroke center, you're going to turn your ears off a little bit for this next topic, okay? Because what we're going to go through is for patients that have access to rapid thrombectomy. So IV, IV thrombolysis and large vessel occlusion, the potential benefits. It can contribute to reperfusion, averting the need for endovascular therapy. I already showed you a case in the extended window where that could happen. It might promote dissolution for downstream microemboli to improve distal perfusion. But the risks, we know the risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. Maybe if those clots move more downstream, it can actually cause worsening distal perfusion. Maybe it'll delay the start of endovascular therapy. It does limit the use of antithrombetic therapy for 24 hours. And is there increased cost, right? These drugs cost six to eight grand. So should we skip IV and go direct MT? Here are several trials, the skip trial from Japan, direct MT and DEVT in China, and then Mr. Clean No IV over in Europe. The skip trial uh, in Japan, they use a smaller dose. Their population is skinny. They use a dose of alteplase of 0 0.6 mg per kg. All of the other trials do use 0.9 mg per kg. The inclusion criteria is that you could be treated with interventional therapy in less than four and a half hours. 
sorry, with IV thrombolysis within less than four and a half hours. You had to be at the mothership, meaning that your hospital could do an intervention on site. And the vessel that had to be occluded was your internal carotid artery, M1 out to M2. These trials were looking for non-inferiority, meaning if you skipped IV thrombolysis and just got intervention, was that non-inferior? And the Mr. Clean trial, no IV, was actually looking to see if it was superior. So 90-day modified ranking score of zero to two. If you went direct to therapy versus getting combined therapy with lytics, all of these percentages pretty much look the same. Symptomatic interest cerebral hemorrhage, little bit higher if you got IV lysis and then intervention, but not that different. Mortality at 90 days, those percentages pretty much look the same. Achieving reperfusion rates of Tiki greater than 2B. Again, these, num these percentages here are pretty much the same. Maybe a little higher with combined, depending on which trial you look at, but really no statistically significant difference. And even door to puncture time was a little bit the same. The skip trial, their numbers are much lower because they clocked it from when they assigned you to get intervention versus just get IV thrombolysis alone. Whereas the China trials, it was done directly from time of arrival in the ER. What do you need to know here if you combine all of this data? The trials just missed the mark to say that this uh, treatment was non-inferior to skip IV lysis and go straight for intervention. The rates of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage were about the same, 6.5% and 9%. What was important was the survival day at 90 days was about 87% in both groups. And if you add in the other trials, adding in Mr. Clean, there was no difference between the approaches for achievement of functional independence at 90 days. I can tell you at GNI, we are absolutely still giving IV lytics prior to intervention. Okay. If you're going to wait to, for your readings, if you're going to wait for your CT perfusion readings and your CTA readings to see if there's a large vessel occlusion, you're going to lose at least 30 minutes in the treatment window. Okay. Whether for my emergency physician colleagues out there who don't believe in giving lytics, whether you believe in giving it or not, there's no doubt that the quicker that you can give lytics, the better the outcome. Okay, of course we always need to do that safely. But if you're going to withhold therapy and wait for the advanced imaging results, there's no doubt that you're going to lose a good 30 to 40 minutes. And then if your patient's not a candidate for intervention, you're going to be behind the eight ball. SWIFT Direct was another trial. They broke this trial at the European Stroke Conference in 2021. And this was the first trial that actually showed that if you did combined therapy, that the modified ranking score of zero to two at 90 days, they had a better percentage. Post-intervention reperfusion rates were 97%, but there was a higher rate of symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage as well. So what, what does this all mean? Okay, Direct thrombectomy is not superior to a combined approach right now. It may be non-inferior to a combined approach. And direct safe is another trial that's going on. We should have those results in May of this year. So we'll see what that trial will tell us as well. It absolutely does not change your practice model for a drip and ship. For all of the spoke community hospitals out there, you're going to give IV lytics and then you're going to look for the LVO. For those of you out there who are at a thrombectomy capable center or a comprehensive center, should we be giving IV all to place to all LVO patients or are there subgroups who benefit from bridging? And this is the question, right? It really has to be individualized and personalized for every patient. If you have any doubt that there's some contraindication or there's a higher bleeding risk and the intervention suite is available, Maybe we should consider skipping thrombolysis in that uh, population of patients. If you're greater than three hours, right? Remember I just said, whether you believe in thrombolytics or not, 
the sooner you can get them on board, the better they work. So if you're further out in the time window, maybe they should just go to intervention. All of the alt to place or connect to place in the world is not going to unclot a occluded uh, internal carotid artery occlusion. Maybe those patients should just go for intervention. But if your clot is an embolus from atrial fibrillation, those patients are very amenable to all to place and tenecta place. Maybe those patients should get IV therapy first and then plus or minus intervention. And then of course the cost, and we know that cost is extremely important in this day and age post COVID with hospitals flailing right now financially. The other piece of the puzzle is even if you're at a thrombectomy capable or comprehensive center, is your interventionalist in house? Is your interventionalist in house at two in the morning? Are they in house at 9 p.m. at night? Are they in house at Saturday morning at 9 a.m.? 66 year old female last known well one hour prior to arrival. She collapsed in the shower with right sided weakness and difficulty speaking. She's on Coumadin for a history of CHF and pacemaker. This is the one time still with stroke that everything stops because you need an INR to see if that patient can be treated with IV lytics or not. Risk factors as well, hypertension, high cholesterol, CHF. Her blood pressure is good. She looks like she's a potential candidate if I can get an INR. Her blood sugar is good. She's gazing to the left, her right side's weak. She's having speech problems. Her stroke scores a seven. Let's go to CT. No hemorrhage. Okay. I still can't pull the trigger on to neck to place though because I need to wait for an INR. So let's go ahead and get the CT perfusion and the CTA all at once. Increase time to peak, decrease blood flow, normal blood volume. Not only is she absolutely having a stroke, but she's all ischemic. There's really hardly any completed infarction yet. And there again, the left MCA, she's got an M1 occlusion. But what's her INR, right? I'm in a total holding pattern right now to try to get her treated. So it's Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Is one of our GNI interventionalists in house? Of course she is. Dr. Binning's in house. We call, I call, I tell her what's going on. She comes down. She says, we're not going to wait for the INR. We're going to go straight for a thrombectomy. A little bit decreased blood flow here, paucity of vessels here. This is her pre-intervention angio, post-intervention angio, nicely filled out here. Her NIH stroke score is zero post-thrombectomy. Her INR is 1.3. That's not surprising because she was having a pretty decent sized stroke, okay? If her INR was therapeutic, it's not impossible, I've seen it, that you can still have a big stroke like that, but it was highly likely her INR was gonna come back low. She was discharged to home two days later, okay? Uh, we did a repeat CAT scan on her. She couldn't have an MRI because of her pacemaker. So there's a really good example of a case where you would skip IV thrombolysis and go straight for a procedure. It's never gonna be as straightforward, okay? Stroke's complicated, neuro's complicated. It takes a lot of critical thinking to get these patients treated, but again, exciting times, and we have to figure out together what is gonna be the best course for these patients. Is it IV lysis and see what happens? Is it IV lysis plus intervention, or is it just intervention, again, for those 15 to 20% of patients that qualify? Last few minutes here, talking about our last topic. We're going to talk about basilar artery occlusion and thrombectomy. Let me preface this hot topic number four by saying that our neurosurgeons Dr. Vez, Dr. Lehman, Dr. Hakma, Dr. Benning, Dr. Rami, they have always been ahead of the curve and they have been doing thrombectomies for basilar artery occlusions for the 10 years that I've known them. But that's not the norm. And the reason why I wanted to bring this to you guys is that basilar artery occlusion strokes are devastating strokes. Strokes for the most parts do not cause mortality. They cause morbidity. So patients don't end up dead. They end up severely disabled. And polls and surveys of stroke survivors 
there's a good percentage of them that would rather be dead than severely disabled, all right? These basilar artery occlusions, they're very hard to pick up in the emergency department. They present with very strange neuro exams. They present with symptoms that have been going on for quite a while because maybe they're vague. Or the other extreme is they present completely with locked in syndrome, meaning they can only move their eyes and they can't move anything from the neck down. The historical timeline of endovascular thrombolysis trials for anterior circulation strokes. From 1999 to 2014, all of the trials said that doing intervention was doing more harm than good. And then Dr. Binning and I were at International Stroke Conference in 2015 in Nashville when they broke all of these trials on the right of your screen that finally they got their act together and they picked the right subset of patients. And all of a sudden, if you were a candidate for intervention and clot retrieval, the number needed to treat was two to have a good outcome. That's like practically unheard of for any other medical ailment, okay? There's 2,000 people in a room standing on their chairs applauding that, yes, we should be doing intervention for these patients, okay? But up until 2015, there was a lot of controversy that there was no benefit. Not all large vessel strokes are the same. Theoretically, immediately after a large vessel occlusion of your internal carotid or your middle cerebral artery, you should have an ischemic core of zero with a variable, variable penumbra. But we've kind of suspected, because we see it, that patients don't always present like that. And sure enough, if you look at these two patients, patient one on the left and patient two on the right, both of them had stroke onset within two hours. The patient on the left has a right M1. The patient on the right of your screen has a left M1. But patient one, two hours in, their ischemic score is only seven milliliters. And patient two, two hours in, that whole hemisphere is infarcted. So why is that, right? Saver taught us back in 2006 that two million neurons per minute were dying. Flash forward to 2023, we know that patients are different. There's fast progressors they might be losing 4 million neurons per minute. And then there's slow progressors where maybe they're only losing less than 15,000 neurons per minute. And the posterior circulation specifically is known to hang on much longer than the anterior circulation. Maybe we'll do a basilar artery occlusion thrombectomy 24 to 48 hours later if the CT perfusion supports it. Maybe the CT perfusion doesn't support it, but because basilar artery occlusion is so devastating, we'll still try to open the vessel because you can't kill the brain twice, right? You're not gonna, if your stroke score is 30 or 40, you're not gonna do any more harm trying to open the vessel. The basilar artery trials are the same as the anterior circulation trials. Best and basics in 2019 and 2021 we're telling the neurosurgical community that doing thrombectomy on these patients wasn't seeing any benefit. The best trial was only looking at eight hours. The basic trial was only looking at six hours. They were both very small studies. There was crossover between the two groups, whether we we're gonna treat or not. And they were basically saying that intervention had no benefit compared to just medical therapy. But, like most things, with time, we figure it out. And in October of 2022, you had the ATTENTION and the BEOSH trials. ATTENTION trial looked at 12 hours. BEOSH looked at 6 to 24. And finally, you had these first randomized trials that showed benefit. They used CT perfusion to look for the right patients. They had larger number of patients. And of course, there was a larger number and increase of patients that benefit with a favorable outcome when they got intervention. These patients did have an increase of symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage and some complications from the procedure, like whether that was femoral artery puncture or radial artery puncture, but it was still a strong tend towards reduction in mortality. It is time to approach basilar artery occlusion the same way that we approach anterior circulation large vessel occlusions. 
And we'll end with a case here so that we'll still have a couple minutes for questions. 59 year old male lives in an apartment last seen normal at 9 p.m. last night. His roommates found him this a.m. on a couch with confusion, not moving his right arm in slurred speech. The roommates told EMS that he's a heavy drinker and smoker. That can be anchor bias right then and there. If you're going to chalk him up that he's a drinker or he's a drug addict, you will miss this diagnosis. Try not to have anchor bias. He's hypertensive. This is a little concerning. He has the weird neuro exam. He's looking to the right, but he's also weak on the right. Okay, these are the exams that you have to be careful. You think, well, his neuro exam is not fitting what I'm used to. So maybe he is just drunk. Maybe he is an overdose. Okay, his stroke score is an 11. When your neuro exam doesn't make sense, that's when you want to think midbrain and pons. When you look at a CT, this was initially read as negative, but maybe there was a hint here that his basilar artery is pretty bright. Okay, hyperdense MCA sign, hyperdense basilar artery sign. And sure enough, when you look at his CTA, there's an occlusion here, little bit of perfusion in the uh, distal basilar. Okay, here again, here's your cutoff here. This was the day after New Year's, so we were actually on a holiday schedule. Dr. Rami was in house. He was actually in the intervention suite taking care of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. This gentleman goes for intervention pre angio. There's basically no blood flow to the posterior circulation because his cutoff is here. Retrieve the clot, and then you get nice blood flow to the posterior circulation. His recovery was complicated by alcohol withdrawal. His gaze resolved, his speech improved. He did end up with a right hemiparesis and discharged to subacute rehab. You can see here on the MRI that he's infarcted the left side of his pons. It's an unlucky area to have the stroke. These basilar artery occlusions, these patients, if we don't treat them, they'll end up locked in and completely paralyzed, unable to speak. So yes, he's going to have a long road ahead of him, but he did get improvement. What I want you to take away from the talk this morning, the extended window greater than 4.5 hours from last known well is here. Think tissue window, not time window. To neck to place as the new fibrinolytic, please, if you take one thing away, the max dose is 25 milligrams. Go be an advocate for your hospital and your patients and spread the word. IV thrombolysis is the standard of care. After this talk today, your still number one treatment is IV thrombolysis. Okay. We'll keep an eye out for the future trials to see if we can skip thrombolysis and go for intervention. Tissue clock rather than time clock. Patients are fast progressors versus slow progressors. And it's time to approach basilar artery occlusion the same way that we approach anterior circulation large vessel occlusions. I am going to stop sharing. I think I did it mostly on time. <laughs> thank you guys so much for being here today. Dr. Greenberg, thank you very much. It's actually a very exciting talk and uh, uh, many, many positive already. Uh, a, a lot of positive feedback coming in. I'm going to squeeze in several questions for you. Yes, please. Um, you mentioned that there are these fast progressors and slow progressors. What determines that? Is that the occlusion type or, or some sort of intrinsic tissue thing? We don't know. That's a great question. Um, we don't know. We don't know why some patients are slow versus fast because I can tell you that I've seen the fast progressors be in patients as young as 36 years old. So it doesn't seem to be age related and it doesn't really seem to be vessel related either. Um, and that's why it's really important that we jump on these patients because until you get that CT perfusion or your CTA, you're not really gonna know if you're dealing with a fast progressor or a slow progressor. It might be even something to do with the collaterals, but who knows? It's uh, intra you didn't mention intraarterial intraarterial thrombolysis. Where do we? Is this even used right now or not? 
That's a better question for the neurosurgeons. I do know that they will give intra-arterial thrombolysis to a certain subset of patients, but for the most part, most of the patients that we deal with are able to get that tiki 2 b or tiki 3 perfusion simply with clot retrieval. Okay. And uh, one more, I love the concept of tissue window rather than the <laughs> time window, um, but we're still stuck with time windows frequently. Um, yes. Now, many trials are using, you know, extended trials, nine hours, 12 hours, 24 hours. How do people come up with these hours? Why not 10, 11 hours? Where are these hours coming from? Yeah, so that's a great question. And that comes from the historical timeline that, that I showed you. Uh, what we're figuring out is, again, if we put all of our knowledge together, that patients are slow progressors versus fast progressors, that the posterior circulation hangs on longer than the anterior circulation, meaning it's more amenable to intervention, that we need to try to expand those time windows so that we capture more patients. Uh, that's where that's coming from. The historical timeline slide that I showed some of those extended to six, some of those extended to 12, and some extended to 24. We talked about the low percentages of patients getting IV lytic therapy. We're trying to see if we can get more patients treated with at least intervention. And the last question, do we really need the NIH stroke scale? Uh, it's all based on CAT scans, uh, et cetera. So. <laughs> That's really funny because I kind of can't stand the NIH stroke score, and I've been joking for years that I'm going to make the Greenberg score because it's going to capture uh, posterior strokes and maybe it'll have less discrepancy of right hemisphere versus left hemisphere. But the answer is yes. And the reason is, is because that's the language that we use to talk to each other, right? If I call you, Dr. Glebus, and say, I have somebody here with an NIH stroke score of 20, your ears are going to perk up right you're gonna you're gonna pay a little bit more attention to what i'm saying versus the nih stroke score of one because the patient has decreased sensation to one side of their body and you know is that even real or not so i don't think the nih stroke score can go away because it's the language of how we speak to each other and there is still value in it for certain strokes meaning again your ears are going to perk up if i tell you that the nih stroke score is higher than six or eight right now we're starting to think even before we get imaging are we headed down that large vessel occlusion pathway and that is what i do right for the case that we showed the tenecteplase we have an NIH stroke score of 20. I have a non-contrast head CT I've given to Nectoplace, but I'm on the phone to Dr. Liebman already to say, hey, I'm using the NIH stroke score to suspect this is a large vessel occlusion, possibly get that intervention suite up and running. Okay. Dr. Greenberg, thank you very much. It was very exciting. It's every, every year you hear stroke talks and there is movement forward and that and uh, that's you know the best thing we can offer you know for our patients we care. Uh, thank you very much everybody for joining today. Have a good one.